thank you all for joining us on YouTube and Facebook Live. Union is proud to be hosting this evening's conversation, Just Sunday, Football, Faith, and Justice. My name is Serene Jones, and I'm the president of Union Theological Seminary. Some of you may not be familiar with Union, uh, but our nearly 200-year-old institution has a long history of educating and training leaders to be socially engaged advocates and activists for justice. With this country increasingly divided along political, racial, and economic lines, tonight's event will examine the role of religion and sports institutions to unite us in the pursuit of justice and social change. This evening, we're going to explore such topics as the ways in which religious institutions and the NFL have helped move the needle on social justice issues, but also the ways in which religion and sports institutions have fallen fall short, uh, fallen uh, very short on racial justice and on social justice issues in the past. And we also hope to offer concrete recommendations for how religious and sport leaders can work in tandem to foster a future in America that is equitable and just. We are pleased to be joined by this dynamic panel of thought leaders from the seminary and from the NFL community. We're working with their institutions to help bring about social change, all of our panelists this evening. So let's get started. We're so fortunate that our moderator, who will introduce the rest of our panel, is Jason Reed, senior NFL writer for ESPN's The Undefeated. Jason has been reporting for over 15 years for outlets including the LA Times, The Washington Post, and ESPN. His work covers in-depth reporting on the NFL exploring its intersections with race and culture, including his April, 17, April 2017 article, The NFL's Racial Divide. That piece, a long form investigation about the role that race plays in the construction of the NFL rosters, won the 2018 National Association of Black Journalists Salute to Excellence Award in sports digital media category. In addition to his work with Undefeated, Reed regularly contributes to other ESPN platforms, including Outside the Lines, the Sports Center, and uh, ESPN, ESPN radio programs, and more. Jason, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. I, I really appreciate that uh, very, very heartwarming introduction. Thank you so much. I uh, am honored to be here. I'm honored to be participating in this discussion this evening. I, I, I don't think it could be more timely. I am so happy to be speaking to the people who I will be speaking to and you all will be seeing coming up here because we're at a time in this country where you talk about institutions like the church and the NFL and clearly we see what has manifest this past week. We see what's occurred for quite some time and when you talk about Sunday and you talk about football and faith and justice, really, uh, these are all things right now that the country can look to and the country needs uh, in terms of trying to get to a much better place. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce these incredible panelists. Now in my day job, I have uh, spoken to two of the panelists previously and also written about them. So I wanna start with the person who I'm very excited to speak with for the first time. The Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas was named Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary and Professor of Theology at Union in September of 2017. She was named the Bill and Judith Moyers Chair in Theology in November of 2019. She also serves as a Canon Theologian at the Washington National Cathedral and the Theologian in Residence at Trinity Church, Wall Street. So please give a welcome to Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, the Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas. That's, that's okay. Thank you, good to be here. Thank you so much. The next panelist I'll introduce is a, someone who has just broke new ground. 
he became the first African-American president of a team in the NFL when he, when he was named president of the Washington football team in August, that was just this past August. Jason Wright is in charge of all of the Washington football team's business operations. As I previously said, he's the first African-American president in the NFL, team president. He's also the, I believe this is still the case, the youngest team president in the NFL, right? Are, are you with me on that still? I'm still am, yep. Okay, still there. Uh, he's the fourth former NFL player to be named a team president. Um, Jason has taken over the reins of the Washington football team at a very important time in, in the organization's history. He's done an outstanding job so far, which is not surprising. He's also a Northwestern man and has an MBA from the University of Chicago. So with those type of credentials, you'd be surprised if you didn't come in and get the job done, which he clearly is doing, charting a new course for this organization. Jason Wright. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. It really, really means a lot hearing that. Thanks, man. And uh, last but not least is uh, someone who I've collaborated with several pieces on in my in my writing. Uh, he's one of my go-to people when I wanted to when I want to get an understanding of what we're dealing with in this country right now. Uh, Benjamin Watson is one of the most thoughtful people I know. He also happens to be a, a, a former great football player. He played 16 years in the NFL. He was a number one draft pick of the New England, New England Patriots, won a Super Bowl with the New England Patriots, also held leadership, leadership positions in the National Football Players Association. He's a, a distinguished author, uh, a book he wrote a while back, Under Our Skin, looking at the power of Christianity and how it can help heal the racial divide. I believe, uh, Ben, you're going to be the executive producer on a documentary coming up pretty soon as well, uh, Divided Hearts in America. Yes, sir. Okay, I could, you know, I want to make sure I got my facts right. You know, I got to do that. <laughs> you got um, you. Um, Benjamin also is, uh, he was past one of the Bart Starr Award, which is in the NFL, it's presented annually to a player who exhibits great leadership on and off the field. And, you know, I've, um, in the last, I think, four or so years, four, four or five years, I've been primarily writing about race in the NFL for my job at ESPN. And several years ago, when there were many, uh, encounters with African Americans and police and and uh you know some some killings that occurred I sat down with, with uh, Ben and, and we we collaborated on a piece together uh that was one of the most impactful pieces of my career and we've done several other pieces together and and as I said whenever I'm trying to get a handle on what's going on I text my man and I just say hey do you have time to talk so I Look, the three people who are on this panel, I do not believe there is a battle panel anywhere where there could potentially be one anywhere in America to discuss the issues that we have to discuss and that we're eager to discuss. So with that, um, I, I, moder I moderate panel discussions often and you know, not, you know, in, in this, in this Zoom world or this virtual world that we're doing these things, you know, it's not the same thing when you have a live audience and you, and you can feel off the audience. And so what I usually do is, or what I always do is I, I put together a script that I'm going to follow and that I can look down, you know, I can look out at the audience and see how they're reacting. But with the events of this past week and with the, with the discussion we're having, I just kind of punted my script and I'm going to just talk like I would talk to, friends and you know who I respect and who are incredibly intelligent and who have so much insight into what's going on right now. So, okay, the, the church and the NFL. You know, the, the, the church obviously is a is a, a extremely important, I, I probably am not even saying that correctly, institution in this country, obviously. Um, if you're a, if you're a person of faith and you know as I am and you pray and you and you try to find answers to the questions that you're dealing with, the, the church is so important in the lives of so many. The NFL is important in the lives of so many. Let's face it, it's the most popular sport in this country. It's the most successful sport on the planet. So, you know, these two entities play a, such a huge role in American life. We are at a very difficult time. And you know, just to get the ball rolling here, can the church and the NFL play a big enough role in trying to bridge this divide? I mean, before we get into what can be done, I just want to know, do you, do you all feel that 
just these two institutions because of the role they play in American life, are they even capable, before we get into to what specifics potentially could happen, are they even capable of helping us get to where we need to be? Because we're not there right now. And I'll, I'll start with the Dr. Reverend first. Uh, well, first of all, thank you again very much, Jason. And it's such a pleasure to be a part of this conversation. As I said back uh, off stage, uh, that if I were able to have a second job uh, and come back again, it would be as a sports commentator uh, because of my deep love and passion for sports. And, and I have followed uh, the careers of each of you uh, as athletes. So it's a pleasure to be here. Your question, uh, can, can the church uh, help bridge this divide and can it uh, have a role in this? Well, you know, uh, it must have a role uh, in bringing us to a better place. That is indeed the uh, role of uh, faith institutions, of religious institutions, of faith leaders. I will say in brief, and uh, hopefully we will expand the conversation, that religious leaders, regardless of the faith tradition uh, from which uh, we come, we are to be accountable, not to the way things are, right? But we are to be accountable to a more just future. We are to be accountable to this just future that in my uh, faith tradition, we uh, speak of is the promise uh, of God that indeed there will be a more just future where all of God's children will be respected as the sacred human beings that they are. And, and I like to talk about that in terms of the last will be first and the first will be last, not because there's a reversal of fortune, but because the last will be first, the first built will be last. There will be no distinction. They will all be seen as equal and respected as such. So the role of the faith leader then, or the faith community and faith institutions, it seems to me is to expand, open up our moral imagination so that we can move toward this, this justice that is not a justice that is confused with the privileges that one may get from an unjust system, an unjust society, but the justice uh, that reflects the sacredness of all humanity. That is the role that faith institutions uh, must play. Uh, first and foremost, in helping us to expand our moral imagination, if you will. Uh, Jason, would, uh, I, I take it you agree? I do. Um, I think the, the church is essential um, because to me, this is not just a problem of economics. It is that. It's not just a problem of, of opportunity and legislation. It is that. But the, the roots of inequity are deep and spiritual. They're age old, right? This, the stuff the we're not warring against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Um, and so the, the things that divide us, the things that give people unequal opportunity, they are rooted in something very deep. And the church has a weaponry, a set of artifacts, a set of things that it can access uh, that can step up to the ancient and deep nature of the actual problem that we all want to see solved. So the church is essential. Um, and then the NFL and any organization of influence is also essential. Um, because I think historically, um, any move of God or any social change, while it might get catalyzed in the masses or catalyzed at the grassroots, the change ultimately comes through the shifting of institutions who have capital and have power and have authority. And uh, the NFL and teams like ours definitely have a sphere of influence that is substantial um, and can make a tangible difference as they are transformed in that process. So, yeah, man, on both accounts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Uh, can you hear me? Um, I, I, I agree as well, as well. Um, you know, the, the, the church, meaning, you know, the body of Christ, it's imperative that we exhibit the fruits of the spirit. It's, it's imperative that we live out, um, what we read in scripture. I'm reminded of John 17, where Jesus is praying, um, for his disciples. And ultimately he's praying for us. 
And his prayer toward the end of that chapter was that we have unity. And not just for the sake of unity, you know, holding hands, that sort of thing, but our unity should be a demonstration and a witness to the world of the unity between Father and Son and Spirit. Our unity should show the world the truth of the gospel. And so the church, the body of Christ, when we fall short of that, we're not only falling short between each other, we're not only not living in uh, the spiritual power that we have from the indwelling spirit within us, we aren't a good witness to the world of the importance and the truth of all the things that we claim to be true in scripture. And so the church has, has you know, an ultimate responsibility when it comes to this issue. Many times we try to divide and say, we wanna be involved with these things and not these things. As believers, we have to be people who step into whatever's going on in the culture, but with the truth of God's word. The NFL, obviously we talk about sports a lot and the fact that sports brings people together. We've been in locker rooms before and we know people from different backgrounds and that sort of thing. That's one part of coming together. The other part of coming together that happens in the locker room is that since we know you, I care about what you're going through. Hmm. So I can empathize with you because I know you as a person. I love you as a person. I know your pitfalls. I take you as you are. Because of that, I care about how you are dealing with what's going on in our country. Outside of the locker room, that doesn't always happen as easily. And so I think the NFL has a great opportunity and has had the opportunity to really demonstrate not just the idea of having diversity for diversity's sake, but actually giving people uh, a voice that is valuable and equal to others. Um, and when you mess it up, being willing to say, you know what, I messed this up. This is where I need to repent. This is where I need to do things better. So I think both both institutions, um, obviously the church is, is a, uh, takes preeminence uh, over over entertainment, you know, which is what football is. But I think within our culture, both of them have tremendous amounts of power, but also tremendous amounts of responsibility uh, in engaging in the issues of our day, especially when it comes to racial injustice. You know, you know, Ben, you just mentioned the word repent, and um, there's a national reckoning occurring on systemic racism racism in this country right now. And the NFL has uh, been part of that national reckoning. Now, the fact of the matter is there was an unofficial gentleman's agreement for many years, ended in 1946, in which black players were not allowed to be in the game. Now, when you talk about systemic racism and you talk about the effects of it, clearly there is going to be an effect if a whole group of people were not allowed to participate in something for many, many years. Now, you, we, we come to present day, we know that the league is, is grappling with the mistakes it acknowledged it made with regard to Colin Kaepernick and the protest movement. Where, how, how do we look at the NFL and its, in its, in its stated attempts now to repent for past mistakes? And how do we judge the NFL? Do we, do we look at it and say, okay, all these things happened and we acknowledge they happened and we're going to give you a chance to do right. Or do we look at it with a more, you know, skeptical eye? Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the first African-American team president in the history of the NFL on this one, Jason Wright. Yeah, I'll hop in. Of course, I'm going to have more of the party line. So someone else should come back. And start to, <laughs> start to really start You're not. Just, being, just being real. No, but I, I, I the party line is a little authentic for me. You know, like I'll, I'll say this. Um, to me, I actually, I'll tell a story to start. Prior to this job, years ago, I was a teaching pastor at a large evangelical church here in Northern Virginia, multi-ethnic congregation. Um, and during the 2016 election, the, the rhetoric tore our congregation apart. And there are other things going on as well in the background. And eventually we left the church, multiple people left the church and it was just sort of in tatters. And it was related to this underlying thing that had not been that had never been expressed before but was seething right under the surface of a different racialized viewpoint of the world of the gospel of all these things that was sitting there just ready to fracture us and it absolutely did um in those moments and the individuals that we were friends with that we walked through that journey with painful moments hurtful moments 
we had, they were on a, especially those who had never talked about race or justice or equity, they were on their journey. And for some of those folks, the starting point in that journey was real crappy, real crappy and real ignorant. And uh, I have taken the approach of, if I have a commitment to those folks or if I have yoked myself to those folks in some way, I'm gonna be with them on that journey. I'm not gonna take on too much pain myself because I gotta deal with my own stuff, but I'm gonna walk with them on that journey and allow God to let me guide them, guide myself to a greater state of understanding and ultimately a way we can impact the world together for the better. I say all of that to say, that's a bit of how I see the National Football League. And frankly, any institution in society or any organization in society that hasn't been that hasn't had substantial minority leadership or been engaged on these topics for some years. And because of that, the starting point is always gonna be one that's filled with misconceptions, misunderstandings and ignorance. And so the mistakes of early on and owning up to those mistakes for me is something I wish I saw more in <laughs> my friends and in my church <laughs> and others. And so from a standpoint of owning the course correction, I think it's a really good thing and it bodes well and shouldn't be brushed off because it's actually, we're finding it's very hard for folks to do that in society. Um, it's very hard for folks to do that. So the fact that an institution like this who put themselves out there in one kind of way have pivoted publicly is not to be sneezed at. Um, and I also think that the league, at least in the conversations I have in the background for sure, recognize that there's so much more ground to go. You know, whether it's representation and leadership, whether it's the way that they use their brand, their influence, the shield to actually make real progress on social justice beyond painted end zones and taglines and all of that. There's real dialogue on it. Um, there's real engagement on it in the background. So I'm going to be, you know, on the party line, net positive. But if I take that hat off, I think I would challenge all of us that are within the machine of the NFL and its ecosystem to think about how we deploy our capital. Because for me, um, you know, and that's intellectual capital, that's relational capital, and that's financial capital. A lot of these issues of equity um, are about capital not flowing to black folks in particular in the same way that have historically flowed to white folks, whether that's opportunities relationally in the profession, whether that's um, the inside knowledge on um, how to craft a, a business or how to craft your career in the industry. I think the NFL has done a good job on financial capital, standing up the, the players coalition and things like that and put substantial capital to it. But there's more we can do. There's things I'm thinking about at the Washington football team of how when we build our new venue, how can we send hundreds of millions of dollars to black owned, brown owned businesses as we do that work? So substantial wealth goes into communities that are commonly overlooked. There are things that we can do like that. And I hope that that is the next movement that's catalyzed for those of us within the machine. So, you know, and I, I guess what it really comes down to, if people state that they that they want to change the lack of a better way to put it, the Christian thing to do is to give them an opportunity to prove who they are. I mean, if you say you're going to do it, then, then you and you don't and you don't give people an opportunity to do that. Well, then that's on you. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I mean, I think it's it, that's that's pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, Benjamin, we we did a story together um, during the NFL draft, and it, what had happened was the, the optics of the NFL draft were that it was very white. You saw because of the the Zoom mm -hmm. situation, it, it, it you saw that there was not a lot of diversity in these draft rooms. But you saw most of the players who were being drafted were African American. So I think it illustrates that the the league has is stated what it's trying to do, and it's shown it too. It's not just it's not just words. I mean, there there has been a lot of money put to social justice causes. The the commissioner Roger Goodell has made it clear that he that he wants to see change in terms of hiring and diversity and inclusion. But Benjamin, it doesn't happen overnight, does it? It doesn't, and I think that that you know you mentioned the Christian thing to do. You know, I think that whenever there is some sort of um, infraction, uh, uh, you have to identify it first. And what we face so long in playing in the NFL, as well as historically with the NFL, is you've heard these outcries come out so much, so often, every single year about the nepotism, about the leadership roles, not just representation, but actually being in a decision-making capacity and having the same opportunity to do so. 
and, and what happened because of COVID and because we were sitting there watching on Zoom, we were able to see the rooms that make the large majority of decisions. We're not even talking about ownership because that's a whole nother animal for another decade possibly or, or millennium. But we saw who was making decisions and that visual, a lot of times, visuals a lot of times are what become catalysts to change. When we think about the civil rights movement, we think about Selma and we think about the fact that television was what people saw that shocked their shocked their system and shocked their consciousness to what was going on. And then we saw a change start to come. I think what we saw last last year, you know, during the draft and we talked about it was just everything that we have been saying, we got to see it. And then everybody got to say, you know what, there needs to be something changed. Couple that with all the events of 2020 um, from protests to George Floyd, obviously, Breonna Taylor, the list goes on and on. And we saw the catalyst for that for that change. And so uh, can the change is the change happening happening quickly enough? Um, I would say we're looking at some of the change uh, right here on this call. Uh, I would say that the awareness that we've seen from the NFL and from NFL owners, from NFL leadership, say, you know what, this is actually an issue that we need to address. I would also say that what we've seen from players, players many times uh, drive change at leadership levels. And so when players start talking about something, when something becomes important to them, they start making noise about it. Eventually, people take notice. And it may be difficult, but we've seen those ears start to turn and those hearts start to turn and the dialogue be created between player leadership as well as team and club ownership and leadership. And together we are able to go out and affect positive change in the society, the change that we want to see. So I love for it to happen overnight. Those things usually don't happen, but I am encouraged uh, with the process that has happened. And you know, whether that's that's financial capital or whether it's opportunities, but even the idea of thinking about these things. Is, is, a, is in a different state than I would say it was before that draft. And that's something that's positive for sure. Yeah. Uh, Reverend Dr. Brown Douglas, I, I, you know, the concept of faith in, and, and, and in trusting people that if they tell you they're gonna do the right thing after doing the mm -hmm. wrong thing, that, that you, you should give them an opportunity. Um, you know, but it's also the deeds. I mean, you, 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 you can't you can't just have faith without there have to be deeds at some point. And and, and what do you feel? I mean, do you feel that the 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 NFL and sports leagues in general are showing enough of the deeds to to to, to inspire more faith? Yeah. First of all, let me say when we talk about the sports, the NFL, whether we're talking about the NFL, the NBA, uh, for instance, uh, we're talking about institutions that are reflective of society at large, right? So they aren't, they, they do not function in a vacuum. They function in a wider society and that wider society uh, uh, is grappling with the its foundation of white supremacy and how uh, over uh, the life of this society that we have seen that uh, what what systems and structures of uh, that are defined by white supremacy do obviously is that they privilege uh, those who happen to be raised white. So here's the thing. You talked about repentance. Repentance means turning around mm -hmm. and doing something different. That means more than simply an apology. That means more than simply representation. That means more than simply diversity. It means turning around and doing something different, which means that we have to then look to see how we got here. And so that we can have, we can bring as many people as we want into an agenda, into a system, but the system doesn't change. It is still a system. It's still a structure that promotes and fosters and nurtures this kind of racial in inequity, this race uh, inequity. And so, and we see this, whether we're, and I don't disagree with anything that uh, Benjamin or uh, Jason spoke of in terms of the things that are happening uh, in the NFL and the way in which one has to spend their capital, but something has to happen systemically and structurally. And we see this, you know, how did we get to the point that a Colin Kaepernick literally gets uh, blackballed, right, uh, in the, uh, in, 
bad choice of words, uh, but gets exiled uh, in the in the NFL. How do we get to that point? How do we get? You know, we I I look at even the ways in which uh, we're looking at coaches as they're dismissed and not dismissed. It, it didn't it wasn't lost on me, for instance, that when we're talking about the two uh, white coaches that were dismissed, we say that oh that them and their teams parted ways. And we get to the black coach and we say that they were fired. The same commentary. Now, what that reflects, of course, is uh, something deep within our culture, but it's also telling, right? Uh, because it's telling about a system and structure that they can say that that black coach got fired and what then becomes the opportunity uh, within that system and structure for him to be picked up again or to move on. That's symptomat that, that statement is symptomatic of something deeper that's going on within the system and structure itself. And that's, that's uh, symbolic of what goes on in our society. So I agree that, you know, we have to give people a chance, but it's about more than apologies. Uh, it's about more uh, than, oh, I'm going to try to do better. Uh, repentance is turning around and doing mm -hmm. something different. And that means that we have to begin to do something radically different, change our systems and structures that got us to this place in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. Uh, Jason, you know, I, I was struck by something you said about, you know, I believe it's your former congregation and, and the and the struggle, the internal struggle around the 2016 election. And it reminds me about the 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 protest movement in the NFL and and, you know, white NFL fans will cheer for black players, I mean, NFL is 70%, about 70% black, mm -hmm. but don't want to hear about the issues that we deal with in our communities that make uh, make them the whole person that they are. And look, I get it to a degree, it's, it's entertainment and they, they want to be entertained, but can the NFL be a change agent and for lack of a better way to put it, educating its it, much of its fan base as to the fact that, okay, you, you cheer for these people, but you need to understand that they're more than just football players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're hitting on, what happened with our congregation, what's happened in society is multiple different people realizing, I thought we were on the same page, but we actually see the world quite differently. Absolutely. Right? And that is a hard thing to realize and to work through the closer that relationship is. And I think, you know, Benjamin touched on this earlier, is that when we are in the locker room as players, you actually for years have been having more of these conversations, probably not at the level they're happening now in locker rooms. But even when I was coming through, we talked about race, we talked about faith, we talked about some of these things in a more raw way, because we had a common landing pad, a common set of experiences and a, a rooted sense of shared identity that was fairly unshakable by being members of the team. And so we were able to have that. I think what is happening is that we're finding less of those tight bonds in broader society. And so the the the, the conversation gets uh, gets toxic really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that the NFL has and can and sports in general has and can continue to be a a driver of more and more productive dialogue. If you think about where this started and people's initial reaction to Cap and Eric Reed and those folks to where the dialogue is today within that same fan base and within that same society, you can't tell me it hasn't changed for the better. And while the NFL was probably not the, the, the ideal steward to carry that conversation forward, we worked our way through it. Right? And, and I think in terms of next steps, there is an ability for the NFL and sports more broadly with its platform to help get everybody on that same page. And it might not be a shared sense of identity and purpose that's hard to develop artificially, but it could be a shared knowledge base. Because I think one of the things that's missing and one of the things that I'm really focusing on with our team and that our players are interested in is we, we're finding that in society we have different concepts of the racial history of this country. And if you're not operating off of the same fact base, and even understanding your current context in light of that, 
it's hard to be together on the solutions. And, you know, so one of the things that our team and our players are really excited about doing is taking a what I call a more accurate view of racial history in America and being the, the folks that propagate that across our fan base and eventually across the country. We've partnered with a firm called EverFi and are putting this black history curriculum that's a bit raw, it's a bit more edgy, that will sand the corners of racial animus and the history of our country. And we're putting our brand and our muscle behind that and using that to get that out. So I do think there are things like that where NFL is such a cultural centerpiece of our society that if we want to disseminate things that are needed, necessary pieces of information or unifying messages, we can absolutely be a conduit for that. Um, so that's, you know, that's one idea, but I, I think you're right. And there are probably other things that we can do as well. Gotcha. So Benjamin, you were, you were in a locker room not too long ago. Um, and, you know, I know that when we have talked about a lot of these issues and we talk about Commissioner Goodell, I mean, he, he has to navigate a minefield. And, you know, I have talked to many people on the other side of the table who these people were negotiating to get to get the Rooney rule strengthened, to, to have more inclusivity and diversion, uh, diversity in hiring. And they tell me, look, Roger Goodell is an ally. He is someone who understands that that what has occurred in the past is wrong and it needs to be righted. But he reports to owners of 32 NFL teams. I mean, Benjamin, can Roger Goodell in and of himself and, and the people beneath him do enough to really affect substantive change? Uh, Kenny, yes, he can. Um, will he is, is the question. And I think that he he has. Uh, I do think he's, he's an ally, but I also do think that he, um, as you mentioned, works for 32 owners and I guess, you know, minus the Packers. Um, and his job is to create revenue uh, for the league. And so he is in quite a, a conundrum, I think, um, which is why I think it took so long for him to, to come out with the statement that he came out with uh, about, you know, kneeling and all the sorts of things that happened. Many felt like it was too late. He did it, but it felt like it was done during a time when it was a little bit more acceptable to do. Look, the the, the place he sits at is not an enviable one. It's not easy, especially when it comes to these sorts of issues. But we believe, I believe that it's incumbent upon him to lead from that position. And he may have to push back on some ownership. He may have to push back on some fans. Uh, when it comes down to doing something that is right and right by the players, you cannot say on one hand that you want to support player initiatives, but then not support them and turn a blind eye to the things that they're going through. And so, like I said before, I think one of your original qu questions was talking about um, how do we how do we view the NFL's efforts? I can remember a little while ago where there was something going on about domestic violence, and there was a team uh, where a guy was involved with a, a domestic uh, incident where he hit his hit his uh, girlfriend, and the whole thing blew up. Well, later on, that same team and across the NFL decided that they were going to have some sort of um, movement uh, to combat domestic violence. And I remember sitting there with my wife and saying, why are they doing this now? They didn't care about it. All it is is it's about saving face and it's about looking good in public simply because they had this go on and they just want to show that they care, but they didn't care about it before. And what she said to me uh, in all of her wisdom was, Benjamin, no matter how they got there, there might be a guy who was watching a commercial they produce and decides not to hit his wife because he saw what they put out, even though it may have been a little late and it, and it may not have been thoroughly authentic, it can still do great good. And that's kind of how I view what's going on right now with the NFL. Yes, they were late. Yes, we wish they would have supported players way back when, more vocally. Yes, we wish that, um, you know, Jason talked about there was this idea of how do we disseminate information? How do we educate our communities? How do we create jobs for for black communities. Yes, we wish all those things were happening then, but there's still good that can come from them happening now. Um, and so R Roger is in a place where he has a great amount of responsibility. And it's always been my encouragement whenever I've talked to him to step out and lead, especially when it comes to this issue. And the main moral, the main moral of that story is always listen to your wife. That's <laughs> exactly. The, that's the main moral of that. Um, Re Reverend Doctor, I, I, I'm gonna put you on the spot here a little bit. 
what has the church fallen short in what it can do? Because, you know, I'm not old enough to remember the civil rights movement, but I know that from, from books I've read and other things I've read that the the church did have a, a very prominent role, obviously. In, is the church doing enough? Well, that's the quick and easy answer is no. <laughs> you know, no, it's not. And there's always, and I am uh, old enough uh, to remember the civil rights movement uh, uh, and do remember uh, very well. And here's what we know, that any time faith leaders have been involved for movements for change, transformation has taken place. And I think that's because one, uh, they expand, as I said before, our moral imagination. But here's the thing, I say this often, that we call ourselves church is aspirational. That is a challenge for us to live into what it means to be church. No different than as we call ourselves a democracy in this country, that's aspirational. The challenge to, to live into it. So. If the church had been, here's the thing, everything we're talking about has taken place on our watch. This is an indictment in so many respects as well on the church. Just as you talk about, as Benjamin talks about, wouldn't it have been nice if uh, the NFL and Roger Goodell did this before Colin Kaepernick uh, had to get uh, dismissed and all of that, and before players had to step up? Wouldn't it be nice if the church was leading uh, as opposed to following? And then perhaps, perhaps we wouldn't have such a wide gap. Not It's not the gap between uh, people in the nations, it's the gap between the way the world is and the way it's supposed to be. And if we were a little bit closer uh, toward on that arc that bends toward moral justice, then we wouldn't see the great divides that we see amongst people. And so that's the faith community's role, to stay on that arc and to push us further along that arc. And so I think where we find ourselves today as a nation, the church and faith leaders have great responsibility to, to take for that. So no, uh, you are putting me on the spot. I'm, I say all the time that uh, we, just because uh, we call ourselves church does not mean we're church and we're always struggling, between what it means to be a social institution that happens to be religious and what it means to be church. And the state of our nation tells us we haven't leaned far enough into what it means to be church. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Brown Douglas. I, I, I really appreciate that answer. Um, listen, I could do this all night long, but uh, we do have a time limit and we have come to that time limit. And I, I wanna just say before I pass uh, the baton to Dr. Jones that this has been really a privilege for me uh, you know, as I said, Jason Wright, the, the job that you're doing with the Washington football team, just outstanding. Benjamin, the, the, the work you're doing to, to, to tell bridge this racial divide. And I, I tell you, uh, Reverend Doctor, getting a chance to talk to you and and listen to you. And I, I mean, I'm, I've learned some, something. I've learned a lot just in this little bit of time we've had together. So um, I thank all of you for the work you're doing. Uh, you're out there on the front lines, and it's it, it's appreciated. And um, just keep it going because, Lord knows, we got a long way to go. There, there, there's there's no doubt about that. Um, and I think Dr. Jones would like to come in and say a few words. Yes, uh, I just wanted to uh, jump back in here and say my own personal thank you um, to all four of you for your um, honesty tonight. Um, and for taking on a conversation that is not a usual conversation, um, but is absolutely critical to the future of our nation and the justice that we seek. Thank you for the work that you have done over the years. And I thank you in advance for the work that you have yet to do. Um, we have this term in seminary world, uh, in theological um, education called eschatology. Eschatology has to do with the future. 
And we're always talking about how do we bring the world that we have now into the state that we imagine in the eschaton, in the place of the future where God's realm of justice reigns. And we always remember that when you talk about what we are seeking, you always have to say in one sense in the very work that you all are doing is already here. And yet, as we can see when we look around us, that it is both already and not yet. And so I end with the already not yet with a big thank you for being part of this conversation at Union and for all that is to come. And since we're a seminary, we could end by saying, God bless and God speed and may that justice come. Amen.